I have read, I don't think I've read the entire manifesto, but I know measure number five, something I quote a lot that he was basically advocating for the central bank, right? The central, Mm -hmm. central state monopoly on cash and credit. And I like that, that description, I think it was Alex, you just gave that as an excuse for entropy, because Mm -hmm. that's, you could, you could put Keynesian economics in the same bucket, right? It's this pseudo scientific academic excuse for money printing, which is, which is entropy. It's the same Mm -hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, I get this weird. These ideas are very appealing at kind of your first order level of thinking. And I guess that's why it captures so many captures masses. Right. But as soon as you think about Absolutely. it, two or three orders deep, the whole thing falls apart. Um, so that's, I appreciate all the framing there. I liked too, that your book opened with definitions. Because so much of this argumentation, I think, ends up with people just talking past each other, right? Where one guy has this conception of capitalism as like the most evil thing that's ever happened. And someone else has the conception of capitalism as just the natural emergent reality when you leave people alone. And when they have, when you have two, you harbor two different definitions for the same word, you can't, you can't have a meeting of the minds. So I really like that you open the definitions. A couple of them I'd like to read that I actually thought were really good. Um, first one here is capital. You guys define capital as time, energy, matter slash material resources and their higher order products. Capital extends to both the physical and the metaphysical realm. Your thoughts are your most precious metaphysical form of capital. Your time is your most scarce form of objectively measurable capital and natural resources are a form of scarce physical tangible capital. And then you go into a really good definition of capitalism as well. Uh, Maybe I could throw that over to one of you guys and we could talk about that. Yeah, I would say, I would say as the definitions and we have to definitely credit Alex for that, that was his his idea and it was definitely a good call. And and I think really some of that came from the word capitalism because I've Mm. found myself over the last couple of years um, starting to to use that word less and less or even stopping to use that word and instead just using free markets mm-hmm. because that word uh, capitalism is so misunderstood or mis often used and they, it's equated to slavery and colonialism and all these things and capitalism is those things and so it's easier just to call it free markets which is more descriptive and so um, Alex was, uh, you know, no, we, we need to make, <laughs> we need to make capitalism great again. Like, let's really dig in here. Let's really expand on what it is. Um, and so I think that led to the, then these definitions that we have here. Um, I'll, I'll let Alex dig in on the definition, but I would say just on the capital, one of the things I think that's important uh, for that word specifically in reference to this book is that in the original book, as I already kind of alluded to, is that Marx makes the case that the poor uh, the proletariat, they have no capital. They have nothing to offer but their labor. Their labor never leads to them having capital. And I think, I think there's two things there. So one, obviously, in our definition of the word capital, he's wrong. They have uh, other things. I mean, their thoughts, their ideas, their intellectual thoughts are capital, intellectual capital. But I think it's also important to understand the time and the place that he was writing this. And so he was writing this approximately 80 years after the start of the Industrial Revolution. And so it was at a time where, you know, he, he wanted to write philosophy. He didn't want to go into be an attorney like his parents, but the world didn't value that at that time. He couldn't earn a living as a philosopher at that time. And so his, his intellectual capital wasn't there at that, at that point in time. And so I think it's important to understand today, of course, you can make, make a living being a philosopher. Uh, Robert, you're doing a pretty good job at that. <laughs> Uh, and so, but I think at that time, maybe that, that shed light to it, but, but today we can see that uh, you can be a writer, right? You, there's a lots of other forms of capital. And so that's one reason why I think that is specifically important for this book because of the way he defined it. And Alex, I'll let, go ahead and let you fill in the rest on capitalism. Yeah, I think just to t- tack on to your piece there about Marx and the period in which he wrote this is that j- just like individuals, have to go through stages in life. Like before you become a mature adult, what do you do? You make a bunch of stupid mistakes. Like, you know, when you're a kid, you get on a bike, you fall off, you make a mess of yourself, etc. Like civilization also has to go through these stages of growth. And some of them are going to be messy, particularly the more trans transitional periods, like the industrial revolution was a real 
stark contrast to what preceded it. And th there was a lot of movement. And he was right about a lot of his observations. Where Marx really goes wrong is about his conclusions in relation to the observations. So he observed that you've got these people, they're out there working, and it's next to slave labor. Um, you know, they're moving from the farms to the cities, and their quality of life seems to be decreasing. Um, and there's people taking advantage of it. But this is the process that they have to go through. And the same as a business, like look at a startup, for example, when you're the CEO of a startup, you're cleaning the toilet, you're, you're your own personal, you know, assistant, you're emailing everyone, you know, you're running out to, you're doing everything. Um, when you've kind of gone through that, then you, you, you have the ability to pay others to, to do that. And then they go through their own journey. And I think in chapter three of the book, we kind of say, you have an option, you can sort of eat shit today and eat caviar tomorrow. Um, or, you know, the other way around, like you, you chew up your resources now. Um, and, and that's kind of, I guess, to give Marx a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, he was right in the guts of that. And that kind of revolutionary transitionary period is going to last decades. So, so it's kind of hard when you're in the midst of that to really be able to see beyond. But clearly, you know, there's counterfactuals, people like Frederick Bastiat, who could see beyond that. And, you know, maybe it was just that Marx was a hack writer, which, I mean, looking at his crap, he was a hack writer. Uh, maybe that's why he could make any money because there were other writers who were making really good money during that time. Um, but, you know, maybe they were just producing better content. Hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of wrap that, but to, I don't know if you've got any comments on that or if you're going to riff on the capitalism. I, I just wanted to say it's sort of ironic that, you know, Marx wanted to be this professional writer or philosopher, but he couldn't. And he couldn't because, well, I don't want to say exclusively because, but at least a contributing reason was there was an underdeveloped division of labor. There wasn't enough capitalism to support Marx as a, mm -hmm. or Marx mm -hmm. as a writer or philosopher. So right. kind of interesting that he's writing to demonize the very thing he doesn't have enough of to accomplish his professional aim. True. Yeah. I guess in his mind, though, uh, the solution to that wasn't to, you know, create more division of labor. It was just to, and this is what Mark mentioned earlier, is uh, from each uh, of their ability to each according to their need or from each according to their ability. And, you know, that kind of redistribution, it's like, well, if I'm a writer, I should have the same as what you have, Mr. Business Owner, um, and therefore I can do what I want. So, yeah, but and, 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 but, but, but at, I was going to say to Robert's Go point, though, I mean, he, he, he's right. He just didn't, he couldn't see it at that point in time and, and not to give him the benefit of the doubt, but, but it is. So uh, he didn't know it, uh, Robert, to your point, but that was the case, right? So as capitalism continued to emerge and as division of labors continued to um, be divided, then of course that became in demand as it is today. He just didn't know it at that time, which is why, again, so many of these things you have to take into account the period of time that he wrote this from and the, Alex hit on, um, you had before the industrial revolution, everybody worked in the farms and the cottage industry. So I would imagine you had entire families that, well, I wouldn't imagine, my dad grew up on a farm, I know, uh, the entire family works on the farm together. <laughs> Like all the kids, everybody's working together. So I would imagine as those farmers moved into the cities, probably the whole family moved into the factories. I would imagine that those machines were brand new. They probably didn't know how to run them very good. They probably broke down all the time. They're probably very unsafe. And so it probably created very harsh working conditions, right? So the point that Alex was making, there was that transition and it was kind of a necessary thing. Um, so he, 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 you know, given him the benefit of the doubt, uh, but we now have, um, perspective. We now have history to show us that these ideas are wrong. And that's why I think we need to dig in and kind of dust them off and look at them again. Totally. So to dig into the capitalism definition, then, so I think this is one of the pieces of the book that I'm most proud of, actually, is that we, we took on or we offer people a novel definition for capitalism where most of the time when people are arguing for or against capitalism they kind of frame it in as a political modality in their heads and they say oh you know capitalism is you know right wing and i'm a left wing person and fuck you basically like it's just it it it, it gets thrown out straight away because of some form of political leaning and what we tried to do here with this definition 
and it's funny, the, the way this definition came to me was I was writing that uh, Bitcoin is not democratic series. And I had someone who's an anarchist who I uh, respect their work. And she was uh, talking, she, she had a comment in there on one of my pieces. And we kind of went back and forth on this thing. I'm like, no, that's not what I mean, this and that. And I kind of went through and I created this kind of definition of, I was like, you know what? Capitalism is not political for fuck's sake. It's a, it's just a process. We, we turn, human beings turn chaos into order. That's what we do. And we're always trying to find a more effective and efficient way to do something. We've been always doing that. And I kind of coupled that with this idea of, as we define capital, it's like, it's time, energy, and resources. What do we want to do with these three things? We want to use them more effectively and more efficiently. And that's kind of the, the genesis of uh, this definition is when we sat down and Mark and I kind of started going back and forth on this word. And I was like, man, we've got to define this in here. And I think it may have actually been this word that kind of triggered the whole definition idea in the entire book is that let's get very clear on what we mean by this. It's, it's not a political modality. It is simply a process and capitalism exists all the time. It exists since the first time someone threw a stick at some animal to save time and energy in acquiring food. And it existed at the next step, the, the dude that was making the fire and I killed the animal and we cooked the animal and we share it together, like division of labor, capitalism, day one. And it exists in communist states known as the black market. It exists in socialist states, you know, known as the community you know, market or whatever. So it's like, it always exists, exists. In, pr in prisons is, in preschools in pr everywhere. Yeah. So the, the question is how much does the political wrapper or the political modality surrounding it suffocate that process or enable it? That's, that's really the question. That's where politics is kind of like a wrapper around capitalism as a process. And later in the book, which we'll discuss, I think, you know, in a, later in this episode or subsequent, but we've got this really nice graph that we drew out and we sort of said, you know, you got left and right politics. Uh, let's tip that on its side and left and right politics is one side of a spectrum and capitalism actually on the other side, it sits with, you know, organic free market emergent processes. So yeah, I just think that's a powerful takeaway for people. That's wonderful because it is, uh, I think, I can't remember who said this, maybe it was safe Dean that, Capitalism is what happens when you leave people alone. You know, it's just this emergent economic process. We've Absolutely. all got wants. We can satisfy more of the wants working cooperatively than we can in isolation. And that's just the hard practical reality. So you leave people alone. Surprise, surprise. They start to trade with one another to create the division of labor.